been doing it for 17 years, and it's a beautiful situation, let me tell you that. <clears throat> I've been reflecting on what binds us Christians together. What is it that we can find basic and unifying? And in reflecting on that, I see two basic ideas that we need to reflect upon. Namely, one is our belief in God, personified in the Son, Jesus. And the second is the sacrament of baptism. With these two elements, we form a faith community. And it's been variously described in the scriptures in this way, as a sheepfold as a temple, as a building, as a family, as a body. Our human language is so poor that when the authors were writing down the scriptures, they had to come up with all of these words to try to get at this mystery. We had to use these different angles, these dis different facets of our human language to understand this. So when we look at these words used to describe believers, we see they carry the idea of an interaction among people. There's an involvement here. Always more than one. For any one of these ideas to come to life, there has to be cooperation. There has to be this working together if there is to be wholeness. You all know we are not born into a vacuum. All of a sudden, there we are. We do not do business in a vacuum. There's interaction amongst different groups, companies, and people. Nor were the scriptures written in a vacuum, but within a group of believers. We know that for the human body to function well, all the parts must work together. For a building to function well, such as this, all the parts must fit together, otherwise it can collapse. For a family to thrive and prosper, all the members must work together, otherwise it's torn asunder. The first Christians saw this among themselves, this need for a group of believers to be bound together in faith, they faced ridicule and hostility because they stood for what is right and good and just. And because of that ridicule and hostility, they bound themselves even more closely together. And by the third century, they were being described by their faith and their charity. The question I ask today is simply this. Are we known by our faith and charity? It should be noted that these early Christians that I was referring to, that their faith and their charity developed within their faith community. They did not develop apart from it. They knew the need to gather together, to hear the word of God proclaimed in their midst, and to share and nurture that word and how it applied to them. Use a term modern term that's in vogue today, they were well aware of the need for a support group. But too often today, we clergy hear Christians 
say, I don't need church. I don't need that. I don't need it for the development of my faith or my charity. Now, they say that they, a generalization term, don't want to be a part of the church because it's obsolete. It's not needed in this day and age. Or because church teaches things I don't like and I don't care to accept. Or because I see too many weaknesses and wrinkles in the church. And I don't want to be a part of that. But is not church made up of human beings? We as human beings have weaknesses and wrinkles. What more could we expect? Maybe we here in the U.S., because of the onslaught of advertising, believe that everyone and everything needs or must have beauty and strength and health and nice fragrances, and perfect cleanliness. But we must not lose sight of the fact that we live in a world that is full of ugliness, and weaknesses, and sicknesses, and stench, and dirt. I see some of this as part-time chaplain at North Memorial Hospital. Besides being pastor down here, I take that role on. And I see broken bones of young people because they were drinking and driving at the same time. I can give you chapter and verse from this summer. And I see young people overdosed in the intensive care unit. And I see suicides, both those that were successful and those that were not. And I see cancers and other illnesses. That's the real world. And is that not why we are here? To push back the evil and to make this world a better place for people to respond to God? To help recreate the world? If we become too stuck on ourselves or on the weaknesses of the church, the Spirit of God will not be able to work in and through us. It is then that we have failed in our mission. The old adage is still true, you can't give what you don't have. Church community is still important if we are to carry out this mission of Christ. It is here the Spirit of Christ is given, given to us to transform this world. May we be open and ready to follow through. God's blessings upon all of you.
Let your daily pardon strengthen my daily will to love you and all people. O oh Lord, you call me out of the darkness into your marvelous light. Give me the grace to live as a child of light and an heir in heaven, that others might glorify you and be drawn to him who is the light of the world, your Son, my Lord. Amen. We will sing one stanza of hymn number 315. <laughs> second part of chapter, verse 13 and verse 14. Forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And then from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For a few minutes this morning, I'd like to have us focus in on where is our focus in our lives? In our classroom, in our athletics, in music, in whatever you set out to do. Where is your focus at? Uh, about a week ago at the SCA State National, or the State uh, Ball Banquet, Vikings running back Alan Rice shared three things. He said that as Christians, we must do three things. First, look back, learn what mistakes we've had, and learn from them, and try to improve the next time. Secondly, we must look ahead. I think that's important as Christians. We know there's going to be struggles in our lives, and we need to you know, trust that God has a path lined out before us. And thirdly, he said, most importantly, is look upward. God's our source of strength, and I think it's important that we remember to look to him in times of trouble. As it says in Matthew 7, it talks about, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and everything else will be added unto you. In the sermon at the church I attend on Sunday, uh, the sermon message was teaching the truth, and in uh, Paul's writing in Acts uh, chapter 20, verse 19, it says, Serve the Lord with great humility. And in three points under the part of humility, he put down, first of all, that we must rely on God's resources, the things that he gives us to accomplish what we're set out to do. Secondly, we must recognize that without God, we can do nothing. I think we all learn from examples as we go through life. When we try to do it on our own, we're going to fail. But when we trust God, the saying is, 
everything is or everything is possible with God, or through God. With God, all things are possible. Then thirdly, remember who gets the credit for your successes. That they think. Some of the things that happened this year with me with the Minnesota Twins, I know that God had a hand in and was directing my life. And like I say, we talked about where our focus is. Um, person who not many people know that's behind the scenes with us is our equipment man with the Minnesota Twins. Each year before the season starts, he makes up a shirt with a slogan or saying for the year. This year is saying that every player got before the season started was, let's all be a part of the miracle at Fifth and Chicago, which happens to be the address for the Dome. Well, that was kind of the theme, believing in ourselves and believing that we can do it. And a person who became very close to me this year on the team was Greg Gagne, the shortstop, who was one of two really strong Christians on the team. I remember very vividly, we had a practice before we started the American League Championship Series, and as we were walking out to our cars after practice, Greg turned to me and he says, you know, i got to get my focus in proper perspective. And I looked at Greg and I said, yeah. I said, we got to have our first focus on God. And he looks at me and just kind of nodded. So, I mean, for Greg, it wasn't to perform for the people in the stands as much as he do still perform for him, or for his family, or for his teammates. His primary focus was on God, what God can do in his life. I remember uh, a lot of times during the season, Greg would come up to me and say, what's the good word? And I'd share with him a verse that had some type of meaning, such as I read from uh, Hebrews, I was from with perseverance, the race marked out for us. And Greg goes, yeah, he said, we've got to persevere in life. We've got to keep our focus and keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. And so these were a couple really neat experiences that I had with them. And being able to share in the Bible or the chapel service that we had with Greg and about 12 other twins that attended. And I know that uh, at the State FCA banquet, Tom Reiser, who became a Christian three years ago, was sharing how he had gotten to know Greg in a very special way because of that Christian bond that we have. It was explained after the World Series was over with and the players were being dragged here and there to go to interviews. Tom had a chance. He saw Greg being dragged off to an interview, and they looked at each other and both glanced upward. And as Tom said, that was all that had to be said. They knew who got the glory for the victory. And I know Greg was really excited throughout the World Series and the American League Championship Series because he came back one day after practice and said, man, I had a chance to share with 15 to 20 reporters about my testimony, my faith in Christ. For him, it was great being in the World Series, but more importantly, Christ was the main thing in his life as I've tried to make it in my life. I know, too, that um, as Greg shared in the locker room one day with Kent Herbeck, Herbeck was trying to say, come on, Greg, have a beer with us or do this with us. And Greg just said, he said, no, man, I don't do that anymore. He said, I used to be involved in a lot more than people realize. And this last year, there was an article in the Minneapolis Tribune about Greg's testimony and shared how one time he tried to kill, us, kill himself by drinking himself to death and couldn't do it. So I know God works in many ways. Another um, experience that helped me to focus in where my focus was throughout this, I had many thoughts going through my mind as we were involved in the World Series. I remember one night, all the enthusiasm of the crowd, and I started thinking to myself, not World Series, the thought that ran through my life was, wouldn't this be neat if all these people were fired up for Christ and we go out and share? I just thought, there's so much enthusiasm here that we could just bottle it and get it into the churches get people involved like that and go out and share their faith. I know the Lord's used me through this experience because before this I had talked to the FCA people in Minnesota and volunteered to go out and speak. And there wasn't really a big demand because I was just you know, a trainer at Oxford College, which didn't mean a whole lot. And all of a sudden, two weeks ago on Sunday, I spoke at a state FCA uh, baseball coach's breakfast. And after the breakfast, I had two coaches come up to me, one from Minneapolis Lutheran, would you like to come out and share at our chapel? And I said, I'd love to come out and share. And they all, the main thing they want me to share is share about the twins. <laughs> and I said, I'll share about the twins, but I said, there's something more important to me, and that's God's word. It means a lot more, but I will share some experiences that have happened through that. Uh, secondly, uh, the assistant coach at Edina uh, came up to me and asked me to come out and speak to their FCA group where I'm going tonight. Just be able to share, you know, what. Uh, people focus on in their Christian faith and what it's like being in professional sports. And it's not all glamour. There's a lot of 
hard work that goes behind it, that type of thing. And one of the big disappointments that I found in my life, after they had clinched the American League Series in uh, Detroit, and they came back, I talked with the head trainer and asked him, you know, would it be possible for me to go to St. Louis with the team? So he checked with the uh, people they had to, and the reply came back, no, we can't take it. Then, on uh, Saturday after the when the game was finishing, I talked to the traveling secretary and said, would it be possible for me to go if I paid my own way? So he checked, came back, no, there's no room on the plane. So I thought, well, okay, I can find a way down to St. Louis and get down there and still be able to work the games. Because I had a feeling in my heart that they were going to win in four games. I said, I missed out on the division clinching celebration in Texas. I missed out in Detroit. So I want to be a part of some of this. So it's fun being here, but to be with them when it happens. So on Monday, I left here at 7 in the morning riding down with the AAA trainer with the twins who was helping us with his father-in-law. I got down to St. Louis, and on Tuesday about 2.30 in the afternoon, I was informed that if I was seen in the dugout or the clubhouse, that both the trainer and I would lose our jobs. I mean, it was a real crushing blow to me. You know, here I was all set to work with this. And so then, they bought me a strip of tickets so I could stay for the game, but I hadn't come prepared to sit in the stands and watch a game because it was a little cool. And I just felt that there's feelings against me. I don't know what I had done or why the feelings were that way. But I felt the best thing I could do was leave and get back to the cities, just get away from the total environment. And I knew full well that the players would be behind me because they, I had two players volunteer to pay my way to St. Louis so I could be a part of it. And so I came back here, and Tuesday had to be probably the longest day of my life. I kept doing what most people would do, whether you're faced with a serious illness or a death in the family, or you fail a test, something like that. God, why me? You know, I couldn't figure it out. And finally, by Wednesday, I started realizing, I said, you know, I think the problem is I wasn't listening to God. I let my focus get off of Him. And I, as I look back on it, I think that my main focus was, hey, I wanted to be a part of that team no matter what wanted to get there, rather than what God had in store for me. And through that, God worked in many ways. I found out when the team came back after losing three straight, I was down in the clubhouse on Friday to pick up my parking pass for games six and seven. I had several of the players come up to me, some of them who I had made judgments about, you know, their attitude isn't real good for the team, things like that. All of a sudden, I found God using me saying, see, Doug, you can't judge people. You need to be open to them. And I found out you know, several players who I had misjudged were totally behind me. And I had one in particular come up to me and say, boy, kid, you got a real rotten deal. I just come and said, well, so thanks for the support. But I said, most importantly, we need to keep our focus on winning this thing. And I said, as a team, that's our goal of every team in the, whatever sport you're in is to win the pinnacle of the sport itself. And so for me, I reinforced the players and said, we need to just win the series. And it was real fun that night, like I said, when we won game seven, being around, part of the celebration that. And I've had a lot of people come up to me, both here and at church, and I think, well, have you come down yet? I said, it wasn't hard for me to come down. Because as it's pointed out in the Bible in several spots, one rich man, rich man when he came to Christ, and asked what he needed to do to get into heaven. And so well, he needed to follow the commandments and all these things. And the rich man said, I've done that. And his last thing he told him was to give away all your riches. And the rich man went away very disappointed because he couldn't. And I think that we need to keep in perspective that we can get everything that the world has to offer, but it's not going to fill that need that you have. You know, if we put all our hope and our trust in what the world has to offer, we're going to be disappointed sometime in life. And for me, Monday was great. I felt good still. But I knew that there was still a greater thing that God had in store for me. And I'm finding that out through the opportunities I've had now to come and share what Christ means in my life and being able to share my experience. And um, one of the neatest stories I heard after the World Series was over that night, in the locker room after a lot of the excitement had worn off and a lot of the players had left, one of the players by the name of Kirby Puckett, who most people know, went up to Greg Gagne. And Kirby had been a faithful attender all year at the chapel services on Sunday mornings. Kirby came up to Greg and says, Eggs, there's still a void in my life. He says, I know what it is. He said, I'm going to have to look at Jesus Christ and examine him closer. 
So I know that's one thing that Greg and us are praying for, that Kirby might discover the real need for Christ in his life. Because here's a guy who's making all the money he needs. He's got a wife. He's got a family. Um, he's got everything the world can offer, but there's one thing that God can offer that's much better than what the world can. And I'd like to close with a, a poem that I've shared before when I spoke here. It's called, That's What It's All About. Once on a piece of yellow paper with green lines, I wrote a poem and called it Chops, because that's the name of the dog we owned, and the teacher gave me a gold star, and that's what it was all about. My mother hung it on the kitchen door and read it to all my aunts, and that's the year my sister was born with no hair and tiny fingernails. And Father Tracy took the kids to the zoo and let them sing on the bus. And the girl around the block sent me a Christmas card with a whole row of X's. And my mother and father kissed a lot. And my father always put me to bed at night. She was always there to do so. On a piece of white paper, I wrote another poem and called it Autumn, because that was the name of the season. And that's what it's all about. My teacher gave me an A and told me to write more clearly. My mother didn't hang it on the kitchen door, because the door had just been painted. And that's the year my sister got glasses with black frames and thick lenses, and Father Tracy smoked cigars and left the butts on the pews. And the girl around the block laughed when I went to see Santa Claus at Macy's. And the kids on the block told me my mother and father kissed a lot, and my father stopped putting me to bed at night and got mad when I asked him to. On a piece of paper torn from my notebook, I wrote another poem and called it Innocence, because that was the name of my grief, and that's what it's all about. And the teacher gave me an A and a strange look. And my mother didn't hang it on the kitchen door because I didn't let her read it. And that's the year I found my sister necking on the back stairs and Father Tracy died. And the girl around the block wore too much makeup that made me cough when I kissed her. But I kissed her anyway. <laughs> and my mother and father never kissed anymore. And I forgot about the end of the Apostles' Creed went and about the amendments. And I put myself to bed at night. My father found me sleeping. That's why on the back of a pack of matches, I wrote another poem and called it Absolutely Nothing, because that's what it's all about. And I gave myself an A and a slash on each wrist, and I hung it on the bathroom door, because I couldn't make it to the kitchen door. And the problem is there's too many people in this world who are struggling and suffering that way. A 16-year-old girl in Miami went out one day, came home one day from school, wrote a few words down on a piece of paper, and went out the back door to a lake behind her house and grabbed onto some weeds on the bottom of the lake, and that's how they found her. And when they looked at the piece of paper she had left, she had written the words, if somebody needs you, be there. And I hope that as Christians that we'll be there for people who need it, you know, and keep our focus on Christ, because he'll give us that courage. As I shared with the kids in Minneapolis, that a lot of people know Christ as Lord of the mountaintop. But how many know him as Lord of the Valley? There's going to be a lot of tough times. Like I said, through St. Louis, I learned a valuable lesson. And I just pray that, you know, as we go through the week and we come up on Thanksgiving, we remember to be thankful for all that God's given us and everything that he's done for us in our lives. We try to pass that on to other people. Could you bow and pray with me? Lord, we thank you for this day that you've given us. This is the beginning of a new day. God has given me this day to use as I will. I can waste it, or I can use it for good. But what I do today is important, because I am exchanging a day of my life for it. When tomorrow comes, this day will be gone forever, leaving in its place something that I have traded for it. I want, want it to be gained and not lost, good and not evil, success and not failure, in order that I shall not regret price I have paid for it. Lord, we remember this day, Amy Freed's family. We pray that you'll give them comfort in this time of sorrow. We also remember the family of Al Johnson, because their family and their sorrow. Lord, we also lift up the people from the airplane crash in Denver. We know that you have a purpose for everything that happens in life, and so many times it's not easy to see that. But Lord, help us just to put our trust in you. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on you as we go through our daily chores. We pray these things in Christ's name.
Lord bless you and keep you. And the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. With the merger, it's called Wakusa. It's like Lutheran Council in the USA. It used to be called the National Lutheran Council or whatever. And uh, so I got on my mind all this National Lutheran Church stuff. And uh, I remember some of the classic songs from earlier, like uh, the theme songs for the merger, like Freud Sen Bromley. Royce and Crumley go together because they're warm and chumly. Jim's just like a brother. You can't have one without the other. And Will Hurtsfeld and so forth. Well, a lot of those were just sort of fun, right? And um, that's all right. But um, there's been some other songs written along the line here that work as well for theme songs for the new Lutheran Church.
tricky, but it's not. Those drops of the sixth are very logical. It, we have a way.
folks are not Lutheran here, so uh, you probably have an education today. Uh, thanks, John. Tonight, you will be here for the Kinder Mesa, which is really a nice, nice service. And that's at 9.30 in uh, the Marshall Room. So spread the word. It's, it's just uh, my favorite of all kinds of services. Uh, and also, remember, the liturgical party would need bodies, warm bodies, about 20 more. I haven't been on the stick at recruiting this, well, uh, this year as well as I have in the past. taken from Psalm 33, verse 13. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. From where he sits enthroned, he looks forth on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. A philosopher once said that we all live our lives as actors playing on a part before an audience. Imagine a supermarket. A little two-year-old boy sneaks away from his mother and runs about hither and yon, squealing with delight. But from time to time, he runs back to where mommy can see him even if it means he'll get scolded and told, Bobby, stop that this instant. It seems clear that Bobby is not just running for himself, but wants to be seen running and exploring and even breaking the rules a little. You go to school as a five-year-old, and when you come back home, you tell Mommy everything went on. Why? Why do you do that? Well, because you know that she's interested. You like telling her everything. Why is that? Your high school play, the same thing. You know you do better because your mother is there, plus a couple of your favorite teachers. And you feel a little hurt because Dad had to be out of town and couldn't make it. Little did you perhaps realize the paradigmatic character of this event. We're all on a stage all of the time, playing out our lives before an audience. That's essentially what human life is. Lucky are those of us who have audiences that appreciate us. We grow out into the expectations of others. Those around us nurture us by their friendly, supportive watching. They're like the sun up into whose warm rays the flowers send their blossoms. This truth is buried in a fascinating way in some of the ancient wisdom of the world. In India, for example, they tell the story about what happened when the great god Shiva was once playing around with the goddess Parvati in their high Himalayan home. In kidding once, Parvati covered Shiva's eyes and suddenly a strange thing happened. The universe was plunged into utter darkness. You see, the world is sustained by Shiva's seeing of it. So if his eyes get covered, there's no light. And then only Shiva's third eye, the one that threatens destruction, is open. So Parvati had to stop playing around, remove her hands from Shiva's eyes. Then the light came back. This is what's true for us, too. Take away our audiences, 
those who see us, who look at us, and we're thrown into chaos. Another version of this wisdom is found in Japan, where the story is told of the sun goddess Amaterasu. She was once played for a fool by a nasty prankster god. She felt miffed and went into a cave, her feelings terribly hurt. And the same thing happened. The earth fell dark and lifeless, being totally dependent upon the sun's gaze. So Amaterasu had to be coaxed back out of the cave so that life could go on once again. A similar idea, I think, is found in the Bible. We hear often of God's looking down from heaven at us. Our text, the Lord looks down from heaven and sees all the sons of men. This means essentially the same thing, I think. I sometimes imagine a huge set of eyes looking down from heaven at all of us here on earth. If God to re were to retire somewhere and fall asleep or turn away his gaze, the world would be plunged into darkness. God sustains us by keeping his eyes upon us. His creative attention pushes back the waters of chaos so that a cosmos can appear. These wisdom stories then tell us how essential it is for us to be watched by others. We absolutely depend on the interested gaze of others, especially on the sustaining look of God. If they were to turn away from us, we'd never be able to survive. It's a part of being a human. But there are different sorts of audiences before, before whom we play out our lives. We have our parents and our friends, of course. These tend to stay by us through the years, no matter what. But others sometimes get a bit fickle. They're interested in us only so long as we tickle their fancy. They turn away from us at a moment's notice. We can't count on them. Take the Minnesota Twins. <laughs> Today they've been watched by everyone. Their fans are wild about them. In fact, who knows how much their victories were due as much to their hero-worshipping audiences as to the players themselves. But what happens next year if they turn in a mediocre season? In sports, as in the entertainment world, we only watch winners. We only want to look at stars, never the also rans Sometimes those close to us can act in that way too, of course. They'll audience for us only so long as we follow their scripts. But if we deviate in any way, they turn away. I once knew of a little boy whose mother continued to feed him until he was five years old. She bathed him until he was 10, and generally kept him inside with her, rather than letting him go outside with others his age. Apparently, she didn't feel comfortable letting him out of her sight. This is a sure way to shrivel a child. It's like caging him into a space that's too small for him to develop properly. The problem was this mother's, of course. She couldn't enjoy a play, which opens her up to anything new. She wanted reflected back at her from the stage exactly what she was. We do have some audiences that are more tolerant, of course. We feel freer with them to be what we want to be takes more to turn their heads away. For example, school teachers are typically like this, particularly college teachers. They're better at watching actors who deviate from the norm. It sometimes happens that years later, a former student will return and tell you excitedly what's been happening to him or her. I know this was true of me and my teachers. I often thought of my college professors this way, judging that They'd now be proud of me, even though they weren't there. So I think, in a way, I have been living off my life before them. Our ultimate audience, however, make no mistake about it, is God. And this is the relationship that I found to really prove to be the pattern for all the rest. The big problem we run into often is how to get our audiences back once they've turned away. For various reasons, people do turn away from us. Sometimes it's our fault, sometimes not. 
In any case, we're left on the stage alone, and it's terrifying. We need people to be looking at us. We need to be seen and noticed and followed and enjoyed. We need to be laughed at. We need to be cried with. But what if there's no one there? I was working on this sermon on the word processor down in printing mailing. And Professor uh, Brian Anderson came walking and looked over my shoulder at what I was doing, and I just was writing the third part, which is how we can get back our audiences. And so he said, hmm, how can we get back our audiences? And uh, he said, I asked myself that question about one minute into every class lecture. <laughs> <laughs> and then he thought for a moment, and I suppose I could, I could start removing one bit of clothing at a time. <laughs> right, he's just like his dad. <laughs> I'm fascinated by both the pieces of wisdom that we talked about at the beginning, the ones about Shiva and about Amaterasu. Both cases, the beings suffering from their being turned away from uh, did something. Did something to, to restore that sustaining gaze. In one case, Parvati simply removed her hands, stopping playing tricks. In the other case, the gods had to put on a show for Amaterasu kind of a dance to lure her out of the cave. What would the parallel, parallel picture be in the Bible? Of course, the most horrible thing that can happen to us is when God seems to turn away. The Psalms in the Bible are filled with the agonizing cries of people who have experienced the absence of God. Consider the torment expressed in Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? From the worlds of my groaning. O oh, my God, I cry by day, but thou dost not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Have you ever read the Psalms? You'll be struck by the terrible kind of cries of God not being present. God being absent. So he's turned away his gaze. We, as I say, need nurturing eyes. They make us feel comfortable, good about ourselves, confident, courageous, supportive. It's good when we have appreciative audiences. Now God is certainly the one who always audiences us in such a nurturing way, luring us out of ourselves more and more so we can truly flower. He models for us how all parents and teachers and employers and rulers should treat those under them. But from time to time, like our other human audiences, God can't turn away or seem to. The question is, how can we coax God back? We do this, I think, by imitating Christ. Do what he did. And what was that? On the cross, you recall, Jesus cried out, screaming those very words we just read from Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What this means is that Jesus himself experienced God turning away from him. And what did he do? I see two things. First of all, he kept on acting out his part, even though he felt his audience had left. He kept faithfully living according to the best that he had learned from his upbringing. And secondly, he saw God with the eyes of faith. What do I mean by the eyes of faith? It means that we continue to see God as there, even though the theater looks empty. We still picture this absent God as the merciful, compassionate, attentive one, continuing always to audience our lives, even though we cannot see him. And that's what we need to do to get our other audiences back, too, I think, to imitate Christ there also. Live according to the best that we know in relation to them, but also learn to see them as still present for us with the eyes of faith. Imagine them there and continue to play in front of them. For example, if your parents have turned away from you for some reason or another. Still live, live out your life as if they were present to you, acting out your lines in the best way that you can. And if your teachers disown you and turn away, the same thing. Your sweetheart, what if he or she turns away? 
Fold them before you as a continuing part of your audience. Still put on your best show for them. Try to make them proud of you, no matter whether they ever turn back to you or not. And if God seems to have turned away from you, do what Christ did. Continue to live out the best script you know, and trust that out there in the blackness, the reason why you see nothing may be that the stage's floodlights are so bright. God is still truly there watching with interest your every move. Let me close by describing to you an experience I had when my mother died. <laughs> Just as I awoke the morning after she died, I felt a kind of covering had been taken away from me, and I lay huddled, exposed to the sky above. A brief moment of panic followed. But then I told myself that this would pass, and it did go away. I knew, though, that things would never be quite the same for me again. Now, when she was alive, my mother had exerted a kind of oppressive watching over all three of her children, especially over me, I know. She lived by a, fair, a fairly narrow script and did her best to get us to parrot the same lines back to her. So, no doubt, I gave her considerable pain insisting pretty much on going my own way. But now that she was dead, an interesting thing happened. The thought came to me, now finally she understands. She's with God now, and he's pointing out to her things about me that she was never able to see when alive. Now, the Bible talks about us being surrounded by a host of witnesses, all the saints who come before us. I thought about that, about them, and my parents are now among them. But now I also see God moving in among these saints, pointing out things to them that they should be noticing about those of us whose lives they're audiencing. Always the teacher God is. And they are always learning from him this fine art of watching the saints of God. Maybe when all is said and done, it's only God who is our true, true audience. Maybe he is our only true audience. for your spirit to give us directions for our lives. Thank you for the desire to do your will. Grant that we will remain alert to your call. Also, we'd like to remember um, Mark Lindbergh, Eric Hockenbush, and Kurt Peter, and we struggle to help. In God's name.
Sunday, uh, Reverend Bognitz from North Heights Lutheran Church, which is uh, an interesting church, one that has grown to, I think, about 6,000 members in two different locations, and in Augsburg alone, will be here with the Augsburg Chorale. So we encourage you all to be aware of that and spread the word. The Lord bless us, defend us from all evil, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Before him will be gathered all the nations, 
and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates a sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep at his right hand, but the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, O blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see thee hungry and feed thee, or thirsty and give thee drink? And when did we see thee a stranger and welcome thee, or naked and clothe thee? And when did we see thee sick or in prison and visit thee? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will answer, Lord, when did we see thee hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison? and did not minister to thee. Then he will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. And they will go into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. There's a divided opinion regarding judgment, rewards, and punishment in the state after death. There are those who look for justice to be meted out against those who have taken advantage of the poor, the helpless, and the disadvantaged in this life. There must be justice. There are those, on the other hand, who reject moral absolutes, personal responsibility, and eternal punishment in regard to personal morality particularly and in sexual matters. Consenting adults have the rights to engage in any type of practice they choose as long as it does not affect others is a prevalent view. There's a denial of moral judgment in relationship with human behavior, particularly human sexuality. The scriptures are clear on the matter of judgment and retribution. There are many after-death experiences that are recorded or shared. One of my favorites is that of John Bunyan, the author of Pilgrim's Progress. He had a vision in which an angel took him into eternity. He saw heaven, the glory, the beauty, the splendor of it, wanted to remain there. The angel said, I must also take you to hell. And as he approached hell, he could hear the screams, the agony, the pain, the darkness. He could see the, the fire, the agony of those there. This dramatically affected his life and his perception. I have asked for similar kind of revelation. I have received none. I have had no extra-sensory kind of revelations, and yet in preparing for this message, looking up various passages in the New Testament dealing with judgment, punishment, or rewards in life hereafter, I found well over 100 passages. As I studied these, as I meditated upon these, it was impressed upon me the seriousness in terms of judgment and the manner of life in which we live now, that we are accountable, we are responsible for our actions and for our behavior, and there is a judgment coming. I came to see the
these two basic points, there is a final judgment in which all will appear before the judgment throne of Christ and will be separated to their eternal destination. This passage in Matthew 25 certainly speaks clearly of that. In the book of Revelation, we see that final judgment in Revelation 20. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from his presence earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Also another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, by what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead in them, and all were judged by what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And then the last verse of chapter 21 in Revelation says, But nothing unclean shall enter it, referring to heaven. Not anyone who practices abomination or falsehood, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. There are books by which we will ju be judged. The books in which are recorded our life words and deeds, our thoughts, our attitudes, our actions, all that we have done in life. There's also another book, the Book of Life, Lamb's Book of Life, and only those whose names were recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life would be permitted entrance into heaven. It's clear there is a final judgment. There's also a clarity in terms of the basis for the final judgment seems to be faith that is expressed in life. It's a living personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, in his atoning work, in his shed blood, in his substitutionary death in our behalf. A faith and trust in Jesus as our substitute Furthermore, that faith, that life of Christ implanted in ours, must evidence itself in our attitudes, in our actions, in our lifestyle, in our deeds. Those who say, well, they believe in Jesus, doesn't matter how they live their life, may discover that it does matter how they live their life. For in Matthew 7, there will be many who will come saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. Did we cast out demons in your name? Do many mighty works in your name? And he will say, I never knew you. Depart from me. It's not just our faith in the Lord Jesus, but it's a faith and a righteousness imparted to us that must manifest itself in our lives. And this is manifest in our moral behavior and character. This is manifest also in our treatment of people, our care and our concern for people. There's a holiness without which no one will see God, the scriptures declare. This text in Matthew 25 speaks about our attitude, our care, and our concern for people, particularly for the least of these, for the lonely, the hurting, the suffering, the needy. The right
righteous are ones who are not even aware that they are doing good to the people that are hurting and are in need. For it's a natural expression of faith and life in Christ. It's the Lord who says, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. The unrighteous, on the other hand, would say, well, if we only knew that it was you that was coming to us in this poor, needy person, well, then we certainly would have responded. They'd be looking for merit, for good deeds, for reward. Those who do righteousness out of a righteous heart are those who are doing it not for a reward, but because it's an expression of the love of Christ planted in their heart. It's important how we live our life. We'll have to give an account for every careless word that we speak, Jesus indicates in Matthew 12. And so it's important how you and I live our lives today and every day, how we care for people, that we will be concerned, particularly for those who are in positions of helplessness, who are disadvantaged, that we will care for them. Now, it's important that we know now what will be our eternal destination. Some wonder, can we know? In 1 John 5, the author says, these things are written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. God's will is that we know now what our eternal destination will be. He indicates in the verses preceding that, this is a message that we declare to you that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He who has the Son of God has eternal life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have eternal life. And he says, these things are written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. If you aren't sure whether your name is written in that Lamb's Book of Life, if you aren't sure whether your eternal destination is heaven, God wants you to know. He wants you to be a part of that kingdom he has prepared for those that are his followers. We can respond today, say, Lord, I want you to be my Savior and my Lord, to live and to dwell in my heart and life and to express your life and your love through my life. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that there is a day in which the wrongs of this life will be made right, in which there will be justice meted out, but we thank you, Lord, there's not only justice that will be meted out, but there is grace and mercy that will be given on the basis of Jesus Christ and his atoning work. And Lord, we pray for your grace and your mercy upon us. For we have all sinned and we all fail and we all fall short. There are many instances failed to reach out to the poor and the needy and the hurting and the lonely. Forgive us, Lord, our sins and failures and shortcomings and grant